Hey everybody, welcome back. Mr. G here again. Welcome to the next in the lecture series for Electric Machines ELIC 200. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about a single phase squirrel cage motor. In the last lecture, we did a three phase squirrel cage motor. The one that's used mostly in industry. Now we're going to look at a single phase, the type of squirrel cage motor you're going to find in things in your house. A lot of common furnaces use a single phase squirrel cage motor. The compressor motor in your refrigerator, your air conditioning unit, things like that use a single phase squirrel cage motor. So before we can understand the single phase, we're just going to do a quick little recap on the three phase. So remember we had the three phase stator and we had the three phase waveform. So when we applied this three phase waveform to a three phase stator, what happens was a magnetic field is created and in the last video we looked at instantaneous snapshots of what the magnetic field is doing and what is happening is the magnetic field is rotating as this waveform goes through time so the magnetic field is rotating so we have a rotating magnetic field the speed at which it rotates is called the synchronous speed. We looked at how we take a device known as a squirrel cage and this becomes the rotor. This becomes the part that's rotating with these big steel bars being able to handle lots of current. So what we've done is we have looked at what happens when we drop in the squirrel cage when this magnetic field is rotating. So as the magnetic field rotates around, it induces current into the bars. The current in the bar creates a magnetic field and then when the two magnetic fields are reacting with each other the rotating magnetic field pushes the magnetic field or the bars around so again this magnetic field basically is interacting with the magnetic field created around the bars causing the rotor to spin so we have a speed of the synchronous, so the magnetic field as it rotates called synchronous speed, and the speed of the rotor, and the difference between the two is what's referred to as slip. So, three phase waveform applied to a three phase stator, and what we end up with is a rotating magnetic field if we drop the squirrel cage in, the end result is this rotating magnetic field pushes the rotor around. And we get rotation. So now, what happens when we only have one phase of electricity? So instead of three, which is what's delivered to industry, we have single phase electricity. So this is what's delivered to your house. So if we take single phase electricity and apply it to a single phase motor, we have one waveform connected to these two poles. So Basically, what happens is when we're on the positive side of the cycle, 
A magnetic field is created in one direction. When we are in the negative side of the cycle, the magnetic field flops. And then when we go back positive, the magnetic field flops. There's no rotation. It just flops, changes direction. So therefore, if we dropped our squirrel cage inside, there's no rotation of the magnetic field. So that means the magnetic field does not swing by the bars at all. Whoops. It just flops. So therefore, because there's no swinging by the bars, there's no current induced in the bars, and because there's no swinging and rotating magnetic field, there's no rotation happening. So, we have to somehow create a rotation or the appearance of a rotating magnetic field to get the same effect as what we get in the three phase. So we have to somehow cause this magnetic field to rotate around so that it swings by the bars and as it swings by the bars it energizes and puts current in the bars and then we can actually get the rotation. Since we only have one waveform that's coming from the wall, we cannot achieve rotation. So what we need to do is we need to fake it. We need to artificially create another waveform. Since whoever's supplying the electricity, the hydro company, is sending you one waveform, that one waveform is not enough to get this rotation to happen of the magnetic field. So again, we want the rotating magnetic field. So we have to artificially create another waveform. So if we were to artificially create another waveform, let's just say a waveform that looked like this. If we created another waveform, and we created another set of poles we could achieve a rotating magnetic field. So we would go from this location to this location to this location to this location. So what we would do is we would take one waveform and connect it here. And then we would take the other waveform and connect it here. If we could do that, we would achieve our rotating magnetic field. Then we drop in our squirrel cage. And as we rotate from here to here to here, we're swinging by the bars just like we did in the three phase inducing the current, 
and then causing the chasing to happen. So the question becomes, how do we create this second waveform? Well, we have what's known as single phase squirrel cage motor starting circuits. We're going to look at four of them. And each one is going to create that waveform. So, we have this blue waveform here. This is the artificial one. We will call this one the starting current waveform. And we're going to call this one the running current waveform. The running current goes to what's known as the run windings. The starting go to what's known as the start windings. So if we could create this system, taking a single waveform, creating a second waveform, adding a second set of poles 90 degrees from the first, we can actually achieve our rotating magnetic field. Therefore, we can actually get the squirrel cage to rotate. So how do we create this other waveform? Well, we're going to look at four different circuits. Each one is going to create the waveform slightly different. And we'll talk about the differences. So what we're going to be doing is coming up with ways to create a phase shift so we have the waveform that's coming in, supplied by the hydro company. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a phase shift and send another signal through other components. So how do we create a phase shift? Well, there's a couple of different methods. The first one we're going to look at is a difference in impedance. So if you have an inductor, so a winding, okay, so if we looked at the windings on the motor, each winding is going to have a resistance and an inductive reactance. Together they give you an impedance. So if I took these two coils and made them different. So that means they would have different resistances, different reactances. So if that was one coil, and then I created a completely different coil, So with a different reactance and a different resistance. 
they would get a different impedance. And more importantly, a different phase angle. So we can actually create a phase shift between the real current and the one that's being created by just causing a phase shift between the impedances of the two windings. So if we create the windings differently with different resistances and with different reactances, we could create enough of a phase shift difference between them to get a little bit of a phase shift to get a little bit of a rotating magnetic field. Now, the difference between these two angles is not a lot. So that means that the phase shift here would be small. So what that means when we're creating our magnetic field, if we looked at this magnetic field, it would peak out here. Ideally, we want the next one to peak out here at 90 degrees. But it doesn't happen. This phase shift is so small that it actually peaks when we're about here. But it still is enough to simulate the rotation. Ideally, we want strong here, strong here. It's not to say that we don't have any magnetic field here, but it's not happening at the exact moment that we get the peak. So the peak is actually happening about here in the rotation. So somewhere around 30-ish degrees. So we want perfect 90 degrees would be great. But we're actually peaking at about 30-ish degrees. Still enough of a phase shift to create the magnetic field and get it to move or rotate and when we drop in our squirrel cage, we're swinging by the bars, but it's not a perfect system. Perfect system would be if we were peaked out here and 90 degrees later, we were peaked out here. But what we're doing is we're actually peaking out about here. So if we squeeze these waveforms together and we started this one here, this next waveform is actually going to peak before we get 90 degrees rotation. So the magnetic field that is created here is not as strong as the one that's created here. Because remember, the magnetic field happens, or the strength happens at the peaks. That's when the big strength happens. So this system, by playing around with the design of the coils, creating two different coils, will create enough of a phase shift to actually get this to work. But uh, ideally, we want the magnetic field to peak here, we want it to peak 90 degrees later, and we want it to peak again 90 degrees later, etc., etc., as we rotate around. So, what component do we know that introduces a 90 degree phase shift between two waveforms or between
two components. And that is our friend, the capacitor. So in the AC realm, a capacitor creates approximately a 90 degree phase shift. So if we somehow introduce a capacitor into our motor between one waveform and another waveform, we would actually achieve a 90 degree phase shift between the two so that this one peaks here, this one peaks here, this one peaks here. So we have two systems. One is by adding a capacitor to the circuit. The other is by playing with the impedance of the actual windings themselves. So let's take a look at the circuits that we utilize to create a phase shift. These are the four starting circuits that we are going to be utilizing for this particular course. The first one is called resistive start induction run. Here is the run windings. Here is the start windings. This document with all of these pictures are in your uh, class notes. So you'll notice here we have something called a centrifugal switch. The run windings are permanently connected. The start windings are connected only at the start to get the magnetic field to get rotating to induce the current in the bars. Once that happens, we can actually remove these windings from the circuit and the inertia of the rotation will keep the rotor spinning past the magnetic field. So we only need these windings to be connected to electricity at the start. That's why they're called the start windings. So what we do is we come up with a way to disconnect these windings once the motor has come up to speed. So somewhere around 75% of full speed, these windings can be removed from the circuit and we keep the motor running. So how do we do that? There's something called the centrifugal switch. This switch is mounted on the back of the rotating part of the motor. So on the actual armature on the shaft of the motor. And as the motor rotates, this switch opens and disconnects these windings. So through centrifugal force or centrifugal force, this switch is thrown open at about 75 or a percentage of the full RPM. As the motor slows down, the switch then closes again so that the next time you start the motor, the windings are back connected. So again, the start windings are just there for the startup. So this is called resistive start 
induction run. So basically, the phase shift between the run and the start windings are caused by differences in the resistance of those windings. So the whole Z giving that phase shift. So when we're looking at this system, this is referred to as the resistive start induction run. So the resistance difference between these two windings creates enough phase shift to start the motor. Once the motor is up and running, the centrifugal switch opens and disconnects the start windings. And then the motor, once it's started, continues the, to run using induction on the current. So remember this is an induction motor. So again, the start windings are just there during startup. And this is a resistive start. So that means that in the resistive start, we have a centrifugal switch that disconnects this at about 75% of full speed. So using the different resistances of the different coils, we create a phase shift. The next one, capacitor start induction run. In the starting circuit, we introduce a capacitor. So we are now doing, introducing a 90 degree phase shift with the capacitor. So that means the 90 degree phase shift here between the two windings. So the capacitor in the start circuit creates 90 degree waveform creates the rotating magnetic field. Again, once the motor reaches 75% of full RPM, the centrifugal switch opens and disconnects the start. So the start circuit contains the start winding and the capacitor. And then we follow induction run, which is exactly the same as this one. So once the motors start, these two circuits are exactly the same in the run. The switch opens, removes this line. The switch opens, removes this line. So at startup, the capacitor is here, no capacitor. When we're running and the centrifugal switch opens, these motors are identical. There's another version called Capacitor Start and Run. You'll notice there are two capacitors. There's one here in this line controlled by the centrifugal switch. And there's another one, a smaller capacitor, that is bypassing everything here. So, in this particular motor, we have two capacitors in parallel when the motor starts. It creates that big 90 degree phase shift again. When the motor comes up to 75% RPM, the centrifugal switch opens and removes this big capacitor but leaves the small one. So what that does is it will provide current 
to the start windings all the time. Not a lot, because we don't want to burn these out, but a small amount of current is going to this. So we actually end up with, for the full time that the motor is running, we end up with current going to the run and a smaller amount of current going to the start. This helps with what we call the running torque, the strength of the motor at run. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The last of the circuits is what's known as the permanent split capacitor. You'll notice that there is no centrifugal switch and only a small capacitor constantly in line with the start. So that means we constantly have the two waveforms phase shifted, but this is much smaller in size. So the big capacitors that we use in these circuits, oh sorry, this one and this one, create a big current here. The capacitor we use here creates a small current. So again, if you notice, this circuit and this circuit are identical when the motor is running. So when I open up the centrifugal switch here, I'm left with one small capacitor, one small capacitor in the run, sorry, in the start circuit. So we have four starting circuits, resistive start induction run. So there's no extra components, just the centrifugal switch and that centrifugal switch opens up once the motor has reached 75% of its full speed, disconnecting this winding, and all that's left is the induction run. This one, this is capacitive start induction run. Again, we have the centrifugal switch but now we have a capacitor to increase the phase shift to get it as close to 90 degrees as possible. Once the motor is up and running, the switch opens and removes the capacitor and this extra coil from the circuit and we're left with induction run. In this case, this is capacitor start and run two capacitors in the circuit. One is used to boost the start. The other is to maintain a good run. So when the centrifugal switch opens, it removes this one from the starting circuit, but what you're left with is still current constantly going to the start windings. Whereas here and here during the run, there is no current going to the start windings. It has been removed. Permanent split capacitor. Again, a small capacitor connected to the start windings all the time. Provides a small amount of current upon startup. Small amount of current during run all the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the characteristics, the torque characteristics of these starting circuits. So if you remember from our previous lectures with the DC stuff, we talked about starting torque and running torque and what the differences are. If you can't remember, you should go back and watch those videos. They're still up on the uh, YouTube site. 
So what we're going to do is, again, all we're going to do is compare one configuration to the other. And we're going to look at the torque values. So resistive start induction run. Because the current, because the current peaks before 90 degrees, it is not a very strong startup motor. So the starting torque on this particular motor is quite low. The running torque is average. Because there's no components at all in the running part. Capacitor start induction run. Now, capacitor start induction run has a large capacitor in the start circuit, giving us a boost of current and the 90 degree phase shift that we're looking for. So we have high starting torque. Once the motor comes up to speed, it disconnects this, and we are left with the exact same thing as we had before. Capacitor start and run. We have a capacitor in the start circuit, so we get high starting torque. When the centrifugal switch opens, we lose the big capacitor, but remember there's a smaller one that's there, keeping the running torque high in comparison to the others. Permanent split capacitor. We have a small capacitor feeding the coil 90 degrees all the time. So permanent split capacitor typically has a starting torque higher than this one, lower than this one. So we'll say medium. And then if we say this capacitor and this capacitor are the same, then we must have higher running torque. So if we looked at the same motor, but a different starting circuit, changes the characteristics of the motor when it comes to starting torque and running torque. So if we took the same motor and connected these circuits to it, the characteristics of that motor will change depending on how it's connected. Resistive start induction run has low starting torque but an average running torque. Capacitive start induction run has higher starting torque than this one because we introduced the 90 degree phase shift. So we're not going with like 30 degrees anymore. We're going with a 90 degree phase shift. But once the motor is up and running and the start circuit is disconnected, it's exactly the same as the resistive. Capacitive start induction run has capacitors in the start circuit introducing a 90 degree phase shift. So again, we have high starting torque. Once the centrifugal switch opens, we are still left with a 90 degree phase shift capacitor. So the running torque is going to be higher than this one because we are still feeding that coil. Here the coil, the start coil is disconnected. Here we're still feeding it with 90 degree phase shift 
and a small amount of current. Permanent split capacitor. Permanent split capacitor, we have medium kind of torque because on the start system, because we do have a small capacitor that's there. It's not a big capacitor like these ones producing high current. It's a small one, but it is there producing a phase shift. And again, once the start circuit, on this case, opens, and what we're left with is one capacitor, small one all the time, same thing happens here. So depending on the scenario, the job of the motor, you would pick the proper starting circuit for that motor. The speed of a single phase squirrel cage motor is figured out exactly the same as the three phase squirrel cage motor. The synchronous speed is given by 120F over the number of active poles. Per phase, there's only one phase. So a two pole motor, four pole, six pole, eight pole motor. This is an example of a two-pole motor. Two poles. You only count the run. Two-pole motor. So the synchronous speed of a two-pole motor is 3600 RPM. Rotor speed will be slightly less. The difference between the two would be the slip. So, very similar system to the three-phase motor that we talked about. And if you can't remember the three-phase motor, the video is still up on the YouTube site, so go and watch that one. Very, very similar in operation. Only difference is we have one phase of electricity, and we have to artificially create a second one and feed it to another set of windings. Well, I hope this helps. Until next time, everybody stay safe. Take care.